What's up, boxing fans? It's that time again for The Neutral Corner, episode number 131. I am Michael Montero for Boxing Monthly Magazine and BoxingMonthly.com. Before we get it started, and we got a loaded episode. We got a lot to cover, guys. Wanted to give a quick shout out to Adrian Blaze, our newest Patreon supporter. Thank you so much. And thank you to all you guys who, who contribute on Patreon. And I wanted to talk about something real quick, if you guys would oblige me here. You know, I provide this content for you. On top of everything else I do with, you know, the articles for the magazines and the, the radio appearances, the podcast, all that kind of stuff. The Neutral Corner specifically. This is a podcast I provide to you guys with information every week on Monday for free. I don't charge for this. I don't put ads in the podcast. I know if you're watching this on YouTube, there will be ads that pop up, but you can skip over them. I provide this to you guys for free because I love this sport and I think that there's so much misinformation out there. I'm passionate about doing the right thing, putting the right information out there when I can. I know I'm not the only one doing this and doing this for free like I am. But I do feel, and I could say this without blinking or stuttering, that I am one of the best out there doing it. And I try to do it with the least amount of possible bias in my heart and soul. Okay, so with all that being said, I'm not going to charge a monetary fee, but I do have a fee going forward, and it is this. I ask you guys to share this podcast, to share maybe an article you see of mine, whether it's in Ring Magazine, Boxing Monthly Magazine, whatever. If you see one of the videos on my channel, one of my tweets, whatever it is, for every episode of the neutral corner that you listen to that you enjoy that you get something out of it whether it's just entertainment whether it's a different point of view or perspective whether it's a fact about a fighter or the sport in general that you didn't know before whatever it is for every episode that you get something out of i would like you to share either this podcast or maybe it's my youtube channel on your boxing blog, on your Facebook page, on your Twitter account, wherever it is. Share it with your friends. Ask your friends to not only check out the podcast or my channel or my Twitter or whatever it is that you're sharing, but ask them to drop a review, a, a like, a thumbs up or a thumbs down if they want to, whatever. That's better than nothing. But not just a click. A like, a review, a rating, a subscription, a follow. Ask your peeps to do that because this is an organic, independent platform. I do not exclusively sign with any one platform or entity in the sport because if I do that, I got to do favors and I got to go with their agenda. I keep it independent and ad free on this podcast. And I don't ask you guys for a freaking dime. So my fee going forward is that you yourself subscribe, drop a rating, drop a review. And keep in mind, guys, I do analytics reports. I see how many downloads I'm getting, how many streams and shares and clicks I'm getting. And there's a lot of you that listen every week and have it once gone to iTunes and given a rating, a review. You're listening to a 45-minute podcast every week. You can't take an extra 60 seconds and drop a rating and a review on iTunes or SoundCloud or Stitcher or whatever it is. That's what I'm asking for, guys. For every episode that you get something out of it, give a share, a rating, a review, something. That's what I'm asking. And of course, for those of you who can and want to contribute monetarily to help out, what we're trying to do here, you could go to patreon.com slash Montero Unboxing. For those of you who want to rep the brand and get it out there, and you want to rock a Montero Unboxing t-shirt, email me, MonteroUnboxing at gmail.com. Guys, those of you who watched the ESPN card last Saturday, you saw me sitting there about two rows back. 
You saw Tiffany. She was doing photography. She was right there on the ring. You saw our Montero unboxing shirts. I don't sell the t-shirts to get rich. They cost me money. The shipping costs money. The packaging and processing cost money. I don't print them myself. I don't own a t-shirt factory. I have to pay for them. I make a few dollars and I reinvest that in the channel. But the main priority for getting the t-shirts out there is to promote the brand, the Montero Unboxing brand, to get my name out there. That's why I wore the t-shirt while I was working a card last Saturday. And yeah, ESPN gave me a bunch of free advertising, so good for them. But it's about getting the name out there, guys. This is an organic thing, and we're trying to blow it up the old school way. We're not paying for clicks. We're not paying for subscribers or followers on Twitter like 90% of these other guys are doing. I'm also not going to ride the racial shit or the nationalistic shit to move up in the world like a lot of these other channels do as well. Right? Those of you who saw me last week in New Orleans, I was covering a Lou DiBella fighter. Lou DiBella works with PBC. I'm constantly called a non-PBC guy. I recently, recently did a piece in Boxing Monthly on Errol Spence, a PBC guy. Next week, I'll be traveling to Los Angeles to cover a PBC event between Mikey Garcia, who I've been critical of, and Robert Easter. In September, I'll be covering a Golden Boy slash 360 promotions fight in Las Vegas. You see what I'm saying here, guys? I cover everybody, and I do so fairly and as unbiased as I can, and I give it to you for free. So my fee is get the word out. And you're going to hear this from me again, all right? But for now, let's get into news and notes. All right, so I did another one of my famous polls Saturday night after the Manny Pacquiao fight. Who should Manny, who should Manny's next opponent be? Terrence Crawford, Floyd Mayweather II, the IRS, or Bob Arum? <laughs> uh, so far, almost a thousand of you have voted. I think it's like eight, almost nine hundred of you so far have voted, and it's kind of split down the middle. I, I actually expected uh, more of you to say IRS and Bob Arum and troll with me, but a lot of you, twenty-three percent of you, are cool with. A Pacquiao-Floyd rematch happening. I cringe at that. In 28% of you, as of right now, are cool with Pacquiao-Crawford. I get why that should happen from a brand building perspective, but guys, that would end very, very badly for Mr. Pacquiao. So I'll talk more about Manny later in this episode during the review. But just news-wise, reportedly, the reports are that he owes like $20 million to the IRS and that's why he can't fight in America or doesn't want to. Bob Arum, for the record, says it's, it's quote unquote, much less than that. Now, is much less 5 million less? Or is it 10 million less? Or is it 1 million less? I don't know. But I, from good sources here, that it is an eight figure debt to the IRS, over $10 million. Either way, if Manny had a big fight against a guy like Maybe it's Terrence Crawford, but Vasily Lomachenko, that would certainly bring in money. And there are other fighters out there. And again, I'll talk more about this in a little bit. Uh, that would bring in well over $10 million. So there is the potential for a possible fight in America. But Manny is fighting strictly for the money right now. And there are bigger money options outside of America. So, so I don't know if we're going to see Pacquiao Lomachenko. Again, we'll talk more about that in a second. Real quick, though, uh, about Manny, immediately after that knockout win over Matisse Saturday, I saw tweets about performance-enhancing drugs. Instantly, Manny's back on roids, quote-unquote. Just stupid shit like that. If you guys would like me to do a rant video on that subject, as it relates to Manny and performance-enhancing drugs, the rumors that Floyd Mayweather and his people in the media and I use media with air quotes, pushed about a decade ago that still persists today. And the, the reality that there is more circumstantial evidence and even hard evidence linking Floyd Mayweather to performance enhancing drugs than Manny Pacquiao himself. If you guys would like me to rant on that, I'll rant on that a little bit, let me know in the comments section and I'll do that for you, okay? But, all right, so uh, some announced fights coming up. 
Anthony Joshua, Alexander Povetkin. It's officially official September 22nd at Wembley Stadium. <clears throat> so I don't want to toot my own horn and say I told you so and gloat, but I told you so, mother. I can't go with the whole word because then this video won't be monetized. But you know what I was going to say. I did tell you so. <laughs> and it's going to be Wilder Brazil, uh, obviously, later this year. So, uh, look, we're going to get the Wilder fight next year. You know, I was originally thinking it might be spring of 2019. I'm starting to think fall of 2019. We'll talk more about that in the coming months. Anyway, AJ Povetkin is on for September 22. And all things considered, Povetkin is probably no less than the third best opponent of Joshua's young career. Maybe even the second best opponent. So, good fight, man. Good matchup. Now, we could talk about the ethics involved. Should Povetkin even be fighting right now? All that good stuff. But we're not going to go there in this episode. Uh, you know, look, if there's testing across the board, you, you know, and that fight's going to happen, what can you do? It, it's a big fight. It makes a lot of money for both guys. And it is one of the better matchups on paper you can make in a division. So we'll talk more about that in the coming months. All right, Sullivan Barrera versus Sean Monahan has been finalized for August 18th in Pennsylvania. I think that's Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And that's going to be one of those Facebook watch fights that uh, Main Events is doing with Golden Boy Promotions. So I talked about this before. Golden Boy is a West Coast promoter, Main Events on the East Coast. So I think this one is going to be run by Main Events. But that's going to be free on Facebook, guys. So those of you on Facebook, you're going to get to watch more boxing for free. And look, Sullivan Barrera, I still think, is one of the better light heavyweights in the world. He's had a rough run recently because he's fought tough guys, but I still think he's a top 10 light heavyweight. And you get to watch him on Facebook for free. That's pretty cool. Okay, so for the Garcia Easter card, I just talked about a minute ago, that's coming up in Los Angeles at Staples Center. That is going to be a triple header on Showtime. And the co-main is a heavyweight fight. Luis Ortiz fighting Razvan Kojanu. For Ortiz, this will be his return from the loss to Deontay Wilder in March. Man, that fight was in March. Can you? It, it feels like it was a year ago, and it was just a few months ago. It's crazy. And this will also be the return for Kojanu, who is returning from a loss last May to Joseph Parker, a decision loss. So also uh, opening up that broadcast, unbeaten super lightweight contender Mario Barrios taking on Jose Roman in a 10-rounder. More heavyweights. Jarrell Big Baby Miller was supposed to fight Kubrat Pulev, right? And they were talking, going back and forth to do an eliminator bout. And the winner of that fight was going to be the mandatory for Anthony Joshua. Well, apparently Kubrat Pulev demanded the fight be in his native country of Bulgaria. And Jarrell Big Baby Miller wanted no part of fighting it over in Bulgaria, didn't have enough confidence in his power to knock Pulev out, and didn't feel that he could get a decision over in Bulgaria. So he walked away from this eliminator possibility. And now they're saying it's probably... Yeah, because Pulev's team, I was just looking at my notes here, Pulev's team won the purse bid. So they were definitely going to take that fight over to Bulgaria. That's when Miller walked. And now they're saying it's likely going to be Huey Fury that's going to step up and fight Kubra Pulev. I don't know if they're going to have to do a whole new purse bid process or what. They probably will. But I would think that Pulev's people will win the purse bid again. So possibly we'll get Kubra Pulev and Huey Fury over in Bulgaria. Not a bad heavyweight matchup. Not one of the better fights that could be made, but still pretty good matchup and the winner of that will be the mandatory for AJ another fighter had to pull out of an upcoming scheduled fight Ray Beltran was su supposed to fight uh, Roman Andreev but he pulled out because apparently he had an appendectomy he had to get his appendix removed so he's gone now Jose Pedraza steps in so it will be Beltran versus Pedraza Mexican versus Puerto Rican August 25th in the Phoenix area and that's where Beltran lives now these two were supposed to fight each other before it fell through now they're going to fight each other I think that's a good quality matchup and that's going to be a fun fight uh, another top rank on ESPN fight let's talk about some arrests 
What I mean, you know, news and notes. What would it be without some boxers doing something stupid? Maurice Hooker. <laughs> Dallas fighter who recently, you know, shocked the world, the boxing world, by going over to the UK and grabbing a title many didn't feel he was going to get. Got charged with a DUI last Tuesday in Dallas. Now, apparently, there was a cop that was pulled over uh, giving somebody a speeding ticket. And Hooker plowed into a parked police car that hit three other squad cars and a construction truck. So <laughs> I, you can't write this shit. This sounds like the hangover part four or some shit. Two officers were injured and two civilians were injured. No, no, none of this was like life-threatening injuries, but they were hurt and they had to go to the hospital to get treatment. So if anything, Maurice Hooker's insurance his car insurance is going to skyrocket after this because of all the, the expenditures. I mean, he's, he messed up, what, four different, no, five different cars, four people. Now, of course, he had a mandatory defense that he's obligated to, to have uh, against Alex Saucedo of OKC, Oklahoma City, who just had that really exciting fight on ESPN. And Saucedo, top rank, his promoter, willing to go to Dallas to fight Hooker for that title fight. How does this affect all that? I don't know. It remains to be seen. Usually for a DUI, you're in and out of jail. There's some you know, fines and stuff like that, but you don't go to jail and serve any time. It's going to be interesting to see how the sanctioning body responds to all this. You got a dude holding your title. He just got drunk as shit a couple weeks after winning the title and plowed into a parked police car and injured a bunch of people. So we'll see what happens there. Speaking of idiots, Victor Ortiz, on probation for a DUI back in 2016. Apparently he was supposed to check in with his pro probation officer in June, did not do that. As a result of that, he was ordered to go to court last week doesn't show up so now a warrant for his arrest is issued so in cases like this with minor offenders where they work out a deal and everything like that um the the police aren't going to like come to his house and bang on his door and drag him to jail but basically now on his record there's an arrest warrant there so if he gets pulled over if he blows a stop sign if he does anything if he drives erratic whatever and a cop pulls it or runs his tag you know maybe a cop sees him driving by and runs his tag or whatever boom that arrest warrant pops up they're going to take him down right there so the next time he screws up he's going to jail basically so victor ortiz yeah i'm a tree bro not the brightest guy i've seen him around la a few times at a couple of dinners and stuff like that and he just comes off like kind of a meathead almost like a surfer boy kind of just that that stereotype i grew up thinking California people were all like. They're mostly not, but he just kind of fits into that. Just, yeah, he is a tree. <laughs> Remember when he said he's a tree, bro? He was talking about his brain. All right, guys, that's it with news and notes. Let's get into the review of what happened last week. Friday, July 13th at the Novo at LA Live, Golden Boy Promotions on ESPN. Had another card, and in the headliner, Los Angeles featherweight prospect Joet Gonzalez sp scored a split decision win over Mexican Rafael Rivera. Um, it was a 10 rounder. He improves to 20 0 with 11 KOs. I'll be honest, I haven't seen the fight yet. I was working last Friday, I was in New Orleans, so I haven't seen the fight. But from what I've heard, Rivera definitely pushed Gonzalez, but Gonzalez did enough, most people feel, to get the win. And the right man won, but it was very, very close. Uh, all, everyone that said saw the fight said it was close, but they're cool with Gonzalez getting the W. And these are people that I trust. So Gonzalez moves forward. Let's see what he can do from here. Saturday, July 14th, we'll start over in Germany where... Rocky Fielding scores a TKO5 win over Tyron Zuge, knocked him down in the fifth round before getting him out of there, wins his WBA regular or world, whatever you want to call it, uh, super middleweight title. And for Fielding, KO1 loss to Callum Smith back in 2015. And 
he's really rebuilt, rebuilt himself since then, okay? So this was his sixth straight win, but this was the first time he was fighting a pretty good opponent. The, the five wins before this were against pretty poor opposition, and he won a couple of those by split decision. So he was coming into this fight as the betting underdog for, for good reason. Now Zuj, and if I'm saying his name wrong, somebody out there from Germany correct me, but he had only fought in Germany against very poor opposition really his entire career. He won his title against Giovanni Di Carolis back in 2016. I think he had a draw with him in their first fight. Then he beat him in the second fight, wins that title, and defended it against an ancient Paul Smith and Isaac Ekpo twice. That's who he, he defended it against, and then he goes in there against Rocky Fielding and gets caught. So I look at the WBA, and the way they do business, you know, I talk all the time about how they're just pathetic with the multiple champions in each division, and they call this one a, a world champion, this one a super champion, that one an interim champion. They really started doing this to get to these domestic level matchups around the world in markets like Germany. And I'm not saying all German fighters are on that level, but most of them are. And they wanted to get into the, that market and get that sanctioning fees and be able to put titles around these guys' waists. And it's not just Germany, so I'm not just trying to pick on the Germans here. But Germany is one of those markets where the WBA does a lot of business in title fights like this. Does anybody think Rocky Fielding or before this Tyron Zuj were top level 168 pounders? No. But the WBA likes to put title events over there. And you look over the years, all the guys that have held those titles, Robert Stieglitz, Felix Sturm, and the older version of Arthur Abraham, Sam Solomon, Sebastian Zbik, right? And I don't know if all those guys held the WBA title specifically, but I'm just talking about that level of fighter, more of a domestic, regional level fighter on the world stage those guys always came up short they weren't seen as elite level pound for pound type fighters or the champion of the division or anything like that at any point none of those guys were and a lot of these guys on that level fight each other two or three times i mentioned before how zuj had fought uh Carolis twice he had fought ekpo twice in recent years you know these weren't high-level matchups, yet they involved a portion of the WBA title. And I misspoke before. Uh, yeah, this was for the world or regular title uh, for the super middleweight division. George Groves holds the super title. So George Groves is the WBA super, super middleweight champion. Try explaining that to a brand new boxing fan. Anyway, Groves obviously is going to fight Callum Smith in the World Boxing Super Series Season 1 Super Middleweight Finale later this year. So if George Groves wins, he wins that tournament, he has the super title, now Rocky Fielding, a UK fighter, has the regular or world title. So obviously the two of those guys would make for a fun domestic level matchup there in the UK that would do business. If Callum Smith beats George Groves, he takes that WBA super, super middleweight belt, and perhaps it leads to a rematch between him and Rocky Fielding to unify the WBA titles together, because that makes sense. Either way, now Rocky Fielding has options. He's got a lot of options. So good for him, man, to rebound from a KO1 loss, to come all the way back to getting a portion of a complete shit title. We all agree it's a complete shit title. But the winner between Groves and Smith is a legitimate titleist and a legitimate top super middleweight. And Fielding will have a crack at one of those guys should he want it. And that's a big payday for him. So uh, good stuff, man. Now for Tyron Zuj, he was really the last German standing of all these German titleists we've seen in recent years. Like Jurgen Brommer, those, you know, just those kinds of guys I could bring up. And I'm not trying to put these guys down. And some of these guys, a lot of them actually, were very experienced amateurs who carved out very good amateur careers. These are guys who can box a little. I'm not saying they're shit, but they're just not at that elite level. But a lot of these guys win titles because the WBA has 14,000 titles in each freaking division. 
and they go towards fighters like this most of the time. Now, let's go over to the States last week. Also on Saturday, Lake Frenarita, New Orleans, Louisiana, top rank on ESPN. I was there. You saw me. Um, you know, I had my media credential, and I was uh, actually the third row in the media section. But my boy, Scotty Buck, came down from Detroit because Eric DeLeon, one of the few Detroit fighters left in this sport right now uh, with some promise, was on that card. He was on the undercard, the untelevised portion. I think Top Rank may have streamed it on their site, so you guys may have seen it. But uh, my boy Scotty, who's still, he was a former pro fighter himself, and he's still heavily involved in the Detroit gym scene. He works out in all the gyms and hangs out with all the fighters. He's still into the boxing community there. He wanted to come down and see Eric DeLeon, so he flew down the day of the fight. He knows DeLeon and his people real well. And when he got there, you know, we met up or whatever. And he was like, hey, man, I got a seat in the second row. Do you want to come over here and chill with me during the fights? And so I did. So a lot of you guys who watched that broadcast, you saw me there <laughs> just chilling in the crowd with my boy, Scott. He was the guy wearing the hat. And uh, what you, you guys never see the media section because the way they set up most of these cards is where all the cameras are pointing and the, the broadcasters and, and all the network people and all the crazy cables and lights, you know, all the apparatuses, all that's on one side. And that's where the media people are. That's why you guys never see us in the crowd. But every now and then, um, you know, a commission official uh, that I know really well will bring me over to the other side or somebody linked to the promotion. I'll go over there and talk to and you guys will see me. And this was just one of those cases where my boy was down there good friend of mine watching the fights and so I was just chilling with him so you guys saw me rocking the MOB shirt a couple rows back and it was a lot of fun so all right let's talk about the actual fights Teofimo Lopez scores a TKO 6 win over William Silva drops him in the first fifth and sixth now Silva his head was way up in the air fought way too straight up but you guys saw the ringside recap I don't have to go into this in too much detail uh, if you haven't seen that yet, check out my ringside recap from that night. And that you'll see right there the, the media section that I talk about, where you'll see the tables and everything, because that's where I usually shoot those. Sometimes I go up in the stands and shoot them, whatever. But, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to shoot them right down there by the ring sometimes. So I talk about the fights more in detail. Teofimo Lopez, I, I guess he had some uh, issues with his hand. He went to see a hand specialist this week so he's going to get some work done on it nothing major but uh, definitely needs some work so he might be out of the ring for a little bit but he looked outstanding to me he, he, he had the performance of the night he stole the show but that's not to say Regis Progre in the main event failed to entertain because he didn't he definitely entertained the home crowd scores a TKO 8 win over Juan Jose Velasco drops him in the 5th 7th and 8th the difference between Lopez's performance and Progre's performance is I saw Lopez doing everything with intent, not getting hit too much, and systematically breaking down his opponent. Progre systematically broke down his opponent, but he played around a little bit too much in the early rounds. He let himself get hit. He enjoys that. Lou DiBella, his promoter, told me that. We talked and hung out at, at uh, Lou's hotel uh, the night before the fights. And, you know, I had a drink with him, talked a little bit. We did some interviews. You guys have seen those on the channel. And he told me straight up that Progre, you know, makes him, you know, drives him nuts, you know, all the time because, uh, you know, he gets nervous watching him eat these shots. And Progre, that's fun to do. It, it kind of reminds me of Gennady Golovkin in a way. But Golovkin would do that against guys like Dominic Wade and, you know, Willie Monroe Jr., but you don't see Golovkin purposely trying to eat punches from Canelo Alvarez and Daniel Jacobs. You're not going to see that. Regis Progre has to clean that up a little bit. He also wasn't turning over on his punches and doing everything with intent early on. He was kind of playing around a little bit. Maybe he was working through nerves. Maybe he was just working his way into the fight, taking his time. Maybe he wanted to take it more rounds to entertain the crowd. But regardless of the approach, the outcome is exactly what you want. He broke down Velasco and got him to the point where he didn't want any more. His corner pushed him out for more punishment, which was ridiculous. 
but he absolutely destroyed the guy. So both Lopez and Prograve are fighting taller, stronger guys and broke them down. Two great performances. And the crowd in New Orleans is probably three, 4,000. I talked about it a little bit last night on the Dave Smith Show on NBC Sports Radio. I'll try to get a, a uh, link to that posted on the YouTube channel because we did try to record it. And I'll be back on that show in another week or two, so I'll keep you guys updated with that. But anyway, I talked about the potential for boxing in New Orleans. It used to be a big fight town, but there's just not many fighters out of that area anymore. Well, Pro Gray is from that area. He's an exciting fighter. And Lou DiBella told me that part of, and this was a cross promotion between DiBella and Top Rank, and I believe they're going to continue to work together because they actually play along together very nicely. And Top Rank is more of a West Coast operation, although they go all over the place. But of course, DiBella's out of New York. So if they're going to come to New Orleans, it makes sense to continue working together. Anyway, DiBella wants to try to get one of those World Boxing Super Series fights for Pro Gray over to the States, and if he can do it, over to New Orleans. I like Pro Gray's chances in that tournament a lot to get to the final, that is. Now, I don't know about the final yet. We're going to have to see. I think it's going to be him and Josh Taylor. You know, look, all along we thought it was going to be Usyk and Gassiev in the Cruiserweight tournament, right, for the season one. We all kind of knew those were the two top guys. Well, going into the 140-pound tournament in season two, it really looks like it's going to be Pro Gray and Taylor. And, you know, as that fight, as we build to that fight, I'll have to really, really think about who I favor. Right now, I don't have a favorite, but Pro Gray, I really, really think he's going to be in that final. He's got a lot of talent, a lot of skills, a lot of killer instinct. Got to clean up some shit, but he definitely has a lot of potential. And the people in New Orleans are excited. There was a buzz in that arena Saturday night. So later Saturday night here in the States, but technically it was Sunday over in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. On ESPN Plus, Manny Pacquiao fights Lucas Martin Matisse for his WBA world title. So the way it worked out for us is we left the venue after the, the Progre fight. There was a couple walkout fights. We hung around. We got to meet some of you guys like Joel Morgan. Got to meet you out there, man. Shout out to Joel. It was great to meet you in person, brother. And I met a couple of other guys there. And then uh, I met up with Steve Kim, Jim Boone, Big Sam, a couple other guys at a hotel. And we got some dinner. We got some drinks. Steve brought his laptop out. Steve has ESPN+. Plus. He bitched at all of us for not having it yet. <laughs> and I let Steve know, I'm in the process of getting it. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But anyway, we watched the, we watched the Pacquiao Batiste fight right there in the hotel lobby while having drinks and shit. Right across the hallway from a club. So it was a, a fun night, man. We had just a lot of fun. And Friday night, we had actually all gone out to Bourbon Street and gone drinking and got pretty drunk. So we had a really, really fun weekend as a whole. Anyway, to the fight. Pacquiao scores a TKO7 win over Matisse, takes his WBA world slash regular title, drops him in the third, fifth, and seventh. There was just a pattern on Saturday night of three knockdown fights. Lopez Silva, Proge Velasco, Pacquiao Matisse. Three knockdowns. And what I loved about this is Jeff Horn immediately called for a rematch with uh, Manny Pacquiao. You know, normally I would say, man, that's a possibility because Manny could go over to Australia and fight him there and get a ton of money. But because of the way he was treated last time he fought there, the ref let Jeff Horn do whatever the hell he wanted. It looked like an MMA fight. And the judges... Scored it for Horn. And look, there are some people who genuinely believe Horn won. People that I really respect and trust. I still feel Pacquiao won that fight, but it was competitive. Either way. And Horn lost. He lost his title. It wouldn't even be a title unification at this point. There's no damn way Pacquiao Horn 2 is going to happen. But immediately on Twitter, people talking about performance enhancing drugs. And... I, 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 val I verified with the VADA people. I talked to Margaret last, last night, actually. 
And because I had forgot, but yeah, Manny did not do VADA testing for the Jeff Horn fight or the Lucas Matisse fight. He did, however, do testing with VADA for the Jesse Vargas fight and for that third Bradley fight and some fights before that. But let's just go back those four fights, okay? For those of you out there to insist or to insinuate that Pacquiao is suddenly on performance-enhancing drugs because he knocked out a completely shot to shit and half mentally quit before he even got in the ring that night, Lucas Matisse, is insane. Now, I'm not saying Manny Pacquiao did or did not ever do performance-enhancing drugs in his career. I don't freaking know. But when you look at just the, the sequence of events, as I like to say, let's go back to Jesse Vargas and Timothy Bradley. In the third Timothy Bradley fight. In those two fights, Vada for both fighters, for all the fighters, and Pacquiao drops both of those guys multiple times. I think he dropped Bradley multiple times. So he scored multiple knockdowns against a young fighter in his prime, that being Vargas, and a very, very good, highly rated fighter in Bradley. Bradley's certainly a better fighter than Matisse, certainly a better fighter than Horn. He drops those guys multiple times, dominates, barely loses a round to either of them. That is with full VADA testing. Then he fights Jeff Horn with no VADA testing and gets mauled and grappled. Now, Horn is a bigger, naturally bigger, stronger guy, younger, right? But if he suddenly was back on the juice, as all you Floyd Mayweather fans, and let me just put it out there and just say what it is, you Floyd Mayweather fans, you people of that cult, that religion, I'm not talking about legitimate, objective fans. I'm talking about the morons that are Floyd fans on social media. The minions he built on his Instagram account. Those people. That's who's saying this shit. You people seem to forget that Pacquiao had Horn on Queer Street, I think in the eighth round of that fight. I think it was the eighth round. But couldn't close the show. And then he goes in there against... Matisse drops him three times, lands 44% of his power punches, and Matisse's face barely had a scratch on it when he quit in the seventh, seventh round. So the, just the sequence of events, the action that has taken place, does not coincide with any red flags that Pacquiao is doing anything wrong. It's just a stupid, lazy elementary argument and it started with a rumor from Floyd Mayweather and his media social media people that pushed that shit and I know that there are Aaron boys like Pauli Malignaggi and stuff that that jumped on that bandwagon and a lot of guys were just jealous of Manny at that time and again Manny didn't help things with some of the crap he said and did certainly not above suspicion things certainly look suspicious for a while but guys to insinuate that he's on roids because he KO'd Lucas Batisse. There are 10 fighters at 140 to 147 pounds who would have KO'd Lucas Matisse quicker than Pacquiao did Saturday night. Yes, I'm saying it. Several of them. Jose Carlos Ramirez, who's really a prospect with a title right now, Regis Progray, guys like that, Josh Taylor, they would all KO Lucas Matisse right now if they fought today. So Pacquiao knocking him out in seventh round, not, not a huge, huge thing. But Manny is now 60 and 7 with two draws, 39 KOs. This dude went pro in 1995. There are people who, have, who were born that same year who have graduated from college already. That's how long Pacquiao has been fighting as a pro. So, brilliant career. Hall of Fame career, obviously. And this is another small highlight if you're a big fan of Pacquiao. But you guys who listen to my show, you listen to my show for me to weed and sift through the bullshit. This is not a rejuvenated fountain of youth Manny Pacquiao. This is still a very, very faded well past his best, 
decade past his best, Manny Pacquiao, who just beat a more shot fighter looking for a payday. And that's what this was. Golden Boy Promotions did a good job getting their boy a payday. That was the mission when Matisse came back. He worked his way into the payday. He got it. He's done now. He can go walk into the sunset and never come back. Don't need to see him again. I will also say this, though. Matisse, yeah, he appeared to quit. He looked for a way out. But to call him a coward, as some of you are doing on social media, that's not fair. You don't call a guy who goes up in the ring, period, a coward. And that's where I need to defend Matisse to a certain degree. Sometimes it's not your night, okay? Sometimes you know you're not going to win. We saw several corners that were too brave for themselves. We saw several fighters that were a little too brave, and the corners should have stepped in and stopped the fight. Matisse, he's been injured before. He's hurt his eye against Victor Postal. Look, it's his prerogative. He wants to take an E and look for a way out of there. Fine. But this dude, we've seen him in the ring taking hellacious punishment from guys like Ruslan Provodnikov. He's not a coward. So stop calling professional prize fighters cowards. You're not a fan of the sport when you do that. It's a stupid thing to say. It's just stupid and lazy. It's every bit as stupid as saying Pacquiao is on roids for stopping Lucas Matisse, all right? He's not a coward. He quit, yeah, but he's not a coward. Two different things. Now, Pacquiao, WBA world title. Thurman, Keith, one-time Thurman, WBA super title. Could that fight happen? Possible, very possible. A year or so ago, I would say, Keep Manny Pacquiao away from Keith Thurman. But Keith Thurman is so damn inactive and so often injured, and he is a name. It could happen. Bob Arum, who still promotes Manny Pacquiao, doesn't play well with others. He doesn't like to deal with other promoters if he doesn't have to. He can be a big prick about stuff like that. We all know how Al Heyman does business. So... Do I think those two are going to jump at the chance to make that fight? No. Heyman wants to cash Thurman out against Errol Spence. And, you know, for Aram, he'd love to cash Manny out against Terrence Crawford, who has the WBA title, but that ain't happening. We all know Pacquiao won't fight Errol Spence. And not just because the two fighters don't want it. Well, I'm sure Spence would love it, but because the promoters don't want it. So the promoters are going to get in the way here. But perhaps the sanctioning body could force a fight like that. Now, for the record, I'd, I'd welcome a Thurman-Pacquiao fight. I still think Thurman wins, and it, it, it could possibly knock out Pacquiao. But because of his inactivity and injuries, and him mentally being half out of boxing anyway, it might be interesting. It really might to see Pacquiao and Thurman fight at this stage of their career. I know it'd be a big event. Now, the WBC welterweight title is vacant right now. But Danny Garcia, Sean Porter are going to fight. And Al Heyman has worked his, his you know, mojo with the WBC. They're in business together behind the scenes, handing money back and forth to each other. And he worked it out where that's, they're the number one and number two guys with the BC. So they're going to fight. They're eventually the winner of their fight, which I believe will be August or September, will have the BC title. If you're Al Heyman, maybe you put Spence in with the winner of that fight. And maybe you put Thurman in with Pacquiao. That's a way to make a lot of PBC money and work across the aisle. <clears throat> and if, if Thurman were to beat Pacquiao, he's got that scalp on his resume. That's a big deal. It's still a name. It's still a very, very big deal. And if Pacquiao wins, well, then maybe you try to make that fight between you know, a Spence Garcia Porter winner and the Pacquiao Thurman winner. So there's all sorts of possibilities here, guys. Even Amir Khan, who's been you know, sitting around jerking off his dick and cuckolding with Anthony Joshua, posting you know, videos of him jerking off on social media, and every now and then he fights too. And he wants forever has wanted a fight with either Floyd Mayweather or Manny Pacquiao. Well, 
Amir Khan in the UK, big, big fight. American IRS would not be involved in that. So could happen. Call me crazy, but it just could happen. Some of you have mentioned Adrian Broner. That's not going to happen. Broner doesn't move the needle anymore, doesn't bring enough money, makes absolutely no sense. Vasil Lomachenko, people have talked about that. Now, again, normally if Lomachenko right now was the same size as Pacquiao, I'd say no way Pacquiao should go near him. Doesn't make any damn sense. But because Manny is so much bigger and naturally stronger and hits way harder than Lomachenko, hits twice as hard as Loma does, that fight could be interesting. Because Loma, let's face it, he got dropped by Jorge Linares. If Linares could drop Lomachenko, so could Pacquiao. So that could be very, very interesting. Bob Aram has talked about making that 140 pounds. So Loma would keep his lightweight title. He'd move up to 140 for Pacquiao. Pacquiao would keep his welterweight title. He moved down for Lomachenko. You could do that. And... It would be a big, big fight here in the USA that would generate enough money to make it worth Manny fighting in the USA. And it'd be a brand building type of fight for Lomachenko. And Lomachenko's footwork and everything else, you'd have to favor him by decision. There's no way he can hurt Manny though. But Manny would have that power and he'd always have a chance to knock him down or hurt him or maybe even knock him out. So because of all those things, I think that's a very, very big possibility, guys. So many possibilities in the welterweight division right now. It just depends if these guys want to play together or do their separate thing. We probably know it's going to happen. They're going to do their separate thing. But even if they do that, still a lot of possibilities. All right, so we got a lot to preview this week, guys. Let's get into all the action coming up this week. On Friday, July 20th, we have a few different fights around the world. In Quebec, Canada, Jean Pascal is fighting in a cruiserweight fight. Whatever happened to that retirement? That did not last long. Why would Jean Pascal come back? And why would he come back as a cruiserweight? Makes no sense, but hey, it is hard to walk away from the ring, guys. That, that is just, the ring is a siren that is hard to walk away from. Now, Golden Boy Promotions is doing another card on ESPN from Cancun on Friday as well. Lamont Roche, a Washington DC based super featherweight prospect is headlining. Also on that card, 2012 female Olympian Marlon Esparza in the co-main. This was the chick who was engaged briefly to two-time fellow Olympian Nicola Adams from the UK. I guess they were engaged for like over a year or something, uh, a lesbian couple. And now, uh, I guess Adams apparently broke it off with Esparza because she was partying and going out too much and doing some naughty stuff. And now Esparza has gone back to Dick and is engaged with her personal trainer, Frank. So once you go black, you never go, oh, wait. I guess not every time. I guess that doesn't work every time. Anyway, uh, once you go female, you go... Uh, yeah, so I guess as far as this is a switch hitter. Anyway, she's in the co-main, so you guys can check that out. There's also a Thompson boxing card from the Doubletree Hotel in Ontario. Texas prospect, 130-pound prospect, Michael Dutchover is headlining that one. There's a Telemundo card from Kissimmee, Florida. And in Sloan, Iowa, a showbox card featuring Philly welterweight prospect Jason Enos, who's 20-0 with 18 knockouts. And six foot six Chinese heavyweight Zele Zhang. He also fights on that card. So a lot of little cards all around the world on Friday. So a lot of stuff going on, guys. Your Friday is set. Get some beers and find these cards on TV and some streams online. Of course, you know Thompson Boxing, that will be streamed online. Saturday, July 21st. Sri Saket Sor Rungvisai is fighting a pizza boy in Thailand in a bantamweight fight. I don't know what the hell is going on with Rungvisai right now, but uh, man, all that momentum he once had came to a screeching halt. This guy's, I hope he doesn't turn into the Thai Joe Smith Jr. I don't think that will happen, but 
I hope he can get back to the form we saw him in last time he was on the Superfly 2 card. HBO Boxing has a card. Do you remember HBO Boxing? Do you guys remember that? That used to be a thing. I guess it's coming back because this Saturday at the Hard Rock in Las Vegas, Jaime Munguia fighting Liam Smith. This will be the first defense of his WBO junior middleweight title that he won from Saddam Ali in May. That fight against Saddam Ali, that was in May. That was just a couple months ago. This is another one where it's like, I fe that feels like it was six months ago already. I, I don't know. Maybe because I moved across the damn country, I drove 3,000 miles, and I've been all over the place working, you know, just running around like a chicken, like a chicken with my head cut off. Maybe time is just going way, way slower in my head. I, I don't know. But man, May, that fight, Mugia Ali, that, that for real feels like that was like in January or something. Anyway, it was in May. Two months later, he's defending it against Liam Smith. And Liam Smith was originally going to be the guy who fought Ali, but he had to pull out. So now he's getting his crack at Mungia. He's a natural junior middleweight. Ali was not. So it'll be interesting to see with Mungia what Mungia can do with him. Mungia, the Mexican fighter, has crazy potential. He's only 21 years old. He's 6 feet tall, 29-0, 25 knockouts. But all of you guys talking about the next Canelo, the next big Mexican star, predicting a Canelo Mungia you know, a super middleweight pay-per-view in 2021. All of you need to chill, pump the brakes, relax. Got a long way to go before that happens, guys. And I was actually, when I was out with Steve Kim Friday night, I was, I was telling him that because he's, he's leading this uh, Mungia hype train. And I'm like, Steve, you got to pump the brakes on that shit, man, because this guy hasn't fought nobody yet and he's going to get it. Some of those defensive lapses are going to get exposed by the right guy. And he's going, Mike, you're just a hater. I mean, he was messing with me. We were drinking. But uh, he says I'm officially off the Mungia Express right now. And I was like, you know what? And, oh, and he says once Mungia decapitates Smith, I'm not allowed to get back on the Express. <laughs> I'm not off the Express train. I'm just not 100% on it yet. I, you guys know how I operate. I got to see more than just one performance. Crazy potential. But he wings a lot of punches. He does leave his chin out there to get hit. The right fighter could take advantage of those things and expose them. I don't think Smith is going to be that guy. I will be impressed. I will be very, very impressed if Mugia can plow through Smith the way he did like Ali. But my gut feeling is that this fight is going into the later rounds. I think that Smith is going to do better against Mungia than most people predict. Now, I hope I'm proven wrong. I hope we see a three-round blowout because then I'm going to get excited because Smith, yeah, he's not an elite-level fighter, but he is a natural junior middleweight. He's a bigger fighter than Ali. And remember, he fought Canelo. He took Canelo rounds. Canelo was playing around with him, messing around with him, but still, I think that if Mungia could go in there and walk through Liam Smith the way he did with Saddam Ali, I'm going to, I'm going to start to get more interested. But for right now, we got to pump the brakes and see how he looks. And then we can judge accordingly. Also on this card, Puerto Rican Alberto Machado, the first defense of his WBA 130-pound title that he won off Jazriel Corrales last October. Now, let's talk about the big Big, big, it cannot be overstated enough, big event, I'm sorry, understated enough, in Russia, in Moscow, this Saturday. World Boxing Super Series, Season 1 finale. The biggest fight in cruiserweight history. I've been talking about this for weeks. Guys, this division was invented in 1979. It's 39 years old. This is the biggest fight for all the marbles in the history of this division. As of now, there is no official American TV or streaming information. I'm hoping that gets worked out in the next couple days. But even if it doesn't, find a way. Go online. Those of you who have Facebook and have access to the fight, put it up on your Facebook so you, people can watch it on your Facebook Live. 
Find a way to share a stream of this fight with everybody you know because people need to see it. I'd be going back and forth on this fight as far as who to pick. But the more I've thought about it, the safe bet here is Oleksandr Usyk by decision. But that's a little bit of a cop-out. So I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to maybe be a little controversial with this. But I'm going to take Oleksandr Usyk by fairly decisive decision. Eight rounds to four, somewhere in that ballpark. Here's what makes me say that. Both men are facing the best opponents of their pro career. That's true. Usyk has not fought anybody like Gassiev as a pro. Gassiev has not fought anybody like Usyk as a pro. But in their entire boxing career, amateur and pro, Usyk fought everybody. And not just at the regional level. He fought everybody on the global level. Everybody. Gassiev barely had an amateur career. That is the major difference here. And I think people are not giving that enough credit for Usyk. They're, they're not putting enough weight into that amateur background, that amateur pedigree. And I think that Usyk was injured or else this fight would have happened already. So as long as he's fully recovered from that injury and he's in great, great shape and has the stamina to properly, defensively, responsibly fight this fight, for 12 full rounds, because it's going 12 full rounds, I think that he can make Gassiev miss. I think Murat Gassiev hits like a damn truck. He punches through the target better than any fighter in the sport right now. Anybody in any division. Gassiev punches through dude's souls. But in this fight, he's going to hit a lot of gloves, a lot of arms, and a lot of air. Usyk should win a decision here. What will get interesting for me is the late rounds. When Gassiev's pressure starts to build and build and build, how will that affect Usyk? Is he going to start to drop those hands? His angles, his spinning, you know, pushing off, will that get sloppy? Because if that starts to happen, Gassiev does not slow down as fights progress. He gets better. He gets stronger. He gets into a little groove. And all that punching through the target, suddenly you're not hitting gloves. You're, getting, you're sliding past the glove and you're landing on the temple. That's what you did to Dorticos. Remember, that hook that ended Unier Dorticos, Dorticos put his hands up. He got his hand up in position. But because he was so tired, because he was so softened up, from Gassiev's pressure, the glove didn't get there quite in the exact spot it needed to be. And it wasn't firmly uh, planted against Dortico's head, you know, uh, his, his shoulder, uh, his, his arm wasn't tight on his body. And thus, when Gassiev hit it, it slid over the glove and went right into his jaw. I believe it was, yeah, I don't think it was a temple shot. I think it was right in the jaw. And that was it. That was it. That same punch was being blocked several rounds before. But sometimes a dude's arms can wear out. And mentally he starts to break down. The pressure starts to get to him. I just think Usyk, he's going to control these early rounds. He's going to control the whole first half of the fight. And Dortico's had moments in his fight against Gassiev. But Gassiev was able to really start to punch through the target and break Dortico's down. And I think Dortico's power was vastly overrated. And I said that going into that fight. The guys he had knocked out were not very good to set up that fight with Gassiev. Usyk, I don't think he has world-class power. Clearly, Gassiev's the much bigger puncher here. But Usyk has enough power and also proper placement and leverage with how he throws punches. He's just a much, much better fighter than Dortico's. And because of that... I don't think Gassiev is going to get to him in the early rounds or the middle rounds the way he got to Dortico. So we're not going to see a replay of that fight. I think we're going to see Usyk box to a comfortable decision win. And after this fight, 
Everyone's going to be asking what's next. I hope Usyk stays at Cruiserweight and defends that title a few times. I think Gassiev, win, lose, or draw, is going to heavyweight. And I think because of his body frame, he's going to wear heavyweight pretty well. And I think that within a couple years, he's going to be challenging for, for a title, seriously, against the winner of the Joshua Wilder fights. Also on this card, Fedor Chudinov, Konstantin Pomeranov, Marius Bradis, and Cecilia Brekus. All fighting. It's a loaded card. So I hope that we can find a stream of this thing somewhere, guys. Let me know if you find one. Because as of right now, it's not on American TV. All right, guys. I told you it was a loaded episode, man. I'm, uh, my voice is running out here. I got to go get a drink of water. I did radio last night. And I'm doing this tonight. So my throat has had it. I'm going to go sip some tea or something. I'll see you at the fights.